Hello, welcome to the Addiction Hope inaugural online conference, and we are delighted to have you with us again. Uh, this next presenter is our keynote presenter, and we are so honored to have him. It is Dr. Mark Gold. And I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Dr. Gold. He is the chairman of Riverman Health Scientific Advisory Boards. He serves as chairman of the Addiction and Psychiatry Advisory Board and also chairman of the Eating Disorders and Obesity Scientific Advisory Board. He served as a professor. He's a Donald Disney eminent scholar and also a distinguished professor and chair of psychiatry. Dr. Gold was the first faculty from the College of Medicine to, to be selected as a university-wide distinguished alumni professor and served as the 17th University of Florida's distinguished alumni professors. So real quick, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you are planning on earning uh, CEs from this event, please attend the full hour and watch the chat box to your right where you'll be able to fill out a survey at the end. And with that, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Dr. Gold. Thank you very much, Jackie. And it, it's really a pleasure to be here and speak at this inaugural conference. And it's especially nice for me to follow my longtime friend, Pat Carnes. Uh, we've worked uh, closely together in the past, especially in Mississippi, and, and it's um, just great. So, um, you know, that's a, a, a good introduction of me and my work. As many people know, I, I've worked in the field since the early 70s. Uh, my work mostly from the side of how do drugs work in the brain? And so I'll review some of that early work. Then my work went on throughout the 70s and 80s and we discovered where opioids acted in the brain, where opiate withdrawal occurred in the brain, developed the use of clonidine, um, moved on from that to the use of naltrexone, which now is a standard MAT, medically assisted treatment that um, is injected. We only had it orally in 1978 through my studies in the, the mid 80s. And on the basis of that work, um, I was recognized recently by a drug czar. Uh, Good evening. Uh, I wish I could be there Shelley. in person for this award ceremony. Thanks to the PATH Foundation New York for making all this possible. And congratulations to you, Dr. Gold, for receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award, for dedicating your career to understanding and treating addiction, and for the advances you've helped foster, particularly related to opioids and cocaine. And this really is a lifetime achievement because you are a pioneer of addiction science going back more than 40 years. Thanks in part to your work, we know that substance use disorders are a disease of the brain and that they're preventable, treatable, and a condition from which people can recover. You're also a pioneer of medication-assisted treatment, which is the standard for treating people with an opioid use disorder. Today, medic So I don't know, we could spend all the time on that introduction. It, it just highlights where we're going to start in this presentation, and then I'm going to go through the work that's led us to the current thinking that drugs in targeting the brain's reinforcement sites, in targeting the brain's pleasure centers, um, undermine them and cause changes that are deleterious to their normal function. And so over time, through use, those uh, brain systems are degraded and are not the same as they would be even if the person were to be abstinent without additional treatment. Other things in, in my career, and Drugs are Botticelli um, summarized this for work in cocaine, so our work in the early 80s on cocaine causing dopamine depletion and really dopamine um, central relevance to food reinforcement, to drug reinforcement and sex reinforcement was highlighted early on in, in our work. Um, we also um, had a process addiction paper very early on in the early 2000s with um, internet, which um, now everyone would consider quite standard and an understandable to have a behavioral addiction like that. But we worked in food, um, sex, limited way, ways in collaboration with Pat Carnes and um, internet, but mostly in, in food and drugs. And it was easy to really see because if you look at the 
the work that I'm most cited for, it's here, cocaine and dopamine and opiates. You can see that if um, cocaine as a drug, um, yes, stimulates its own taking, is self-administered by lab animals, does is associated with loss of control, binge use, and what we would call addiction in animals, dependence in, in people. But in the process, um, cocaine is an appetite suppressant used uh, in coca tea or coca leaf chewing, cocaine suppresses appetite. And that very early on led us to say that drugs of abuse compete in the brain for reinforcement sites that are used similarly for food. And um, with the help of, of collaborators, we extended that work and maybe in some of the questions, we'll have a chance um, to talk about that. But you can see that drugs of abuse have an interesting relationship to food. Generally, it's drugs on and food off. And you know, you had heroin chic being a thin, emaciated person who thought that they were fine, or cocaine use in models and celebrities for appetite suppression and, and so on. So um, the exception to that tended to be um, cannabis, but in chronic use, we also see um, appetite changes. So I think that kind of seesaw effect, drugs on, food off, makes sense. And then in withdrawal, the opposite occurs. Um, in opiate withdrawal, there's a rebound overeating. In cocaine withdrawal, there's a rebound overeating. And um, even though that's not classically considered part of the acute withdrawal syndrome, we've highlighted it because we like to look at food appetite changes, temperature, body temperature changes, energy utilization changes, exercise, mood, and so on, because really withdrawal is not just nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea that everyone focuses on for opiate withdrawal. It's anhedonia, depression, um, loss of interest, sleep changes, appetite changes. And as we know from cigarette withdrawal, those changes, those withdrawal uh, long-term or chronic abstinent syndrome changes can be seen for months, if not a year. So um, that kind of, these articles summarize my, what people would consider my most referenced work. And then, you know, in um, academia, the most referenced studies are like likes on Facebook. The more times a scientist references your work, the more um, that work is seen as important. And hopefully it is. But my most famous work um, really is a work on caffeine because it was picked up by CNN. And um, uh, most people would recognize that our group showed that Starbucks and other um, coffees that are, quote, decaffeinated, unquote, are relatively decaffeinated, but oftentimes have more caffeine than any regular coffee. Um, caffeine is a, a drug that stimulates its own taking as well, but given the fact that it's not used intravenously and not smoked, the addiction liability has been quite limited. Currently, I, I spend a lot of time uh, teaching, thinking, uh, mentoring young investigators, and I read uh, over 100 scientific peer review articles per month, um, pick 10, summarize those 10, and they, they're they posted and distributed each month. If you're interested in this, it's, uh, it's easily accessible at um, Addiction Research You Can Use, and you can sign up and we deliver them to you. This is a lot of fun. I've done this project for over a year, and so even if you're just signing up now, you can go back and look at the past year, meaning there's 120 of the best articles that were published in addiction research over the last 12 months that you can just download and read at your leisure. Um, some of these are, are, are articles that you would not see. For example, you know, is drug abuse associated with premature aging? And that's work led by Nora Volkos group as well as are there ways to revitalize aging um, animals and thereby aging people? And you'll see more and more in the literature about, about infusions from uh, uh, young people or stem cell work. 
and uh, much of this is is gaining traction as we figure out um, how cells are programmed and how they age. Also, um, for people who um, don't read uh, recovery literature, I contribute to um, Sober World, and I had an article on um, uh, ketamine, which is, I think, very interesting because ketamine is, is being used acutely in reversal of suicide ideation, but in many places is still a club drug and drug of abuse. Also, I summarized work that we have ongoing, um, looking at some of the deaths in opioid overdoses as poisonings due to uh, adulterants in the drugs. Because most people have forgotten that as we morph from Oxycontin or prescription opioid abuse, where the person um, knew what the dose of medicine was they were taking um, to the current state where so many users are injecting heroin and or fentanyl um, and not knowing what they're taking, we have what's in the drug as the main question in every use. And that's um, sometimes cardiac medications, other medications that have to be avail happen to be available, all kinds of other drugs. Um, and that's highlighted in the deadly adulterants. And um, uh, I also summarized the opioid epidemic. Um, I have an article coming out for the um, psychologists and physicians who see Mayo Clinics uh, in March, summarizing this as well. Another thing that I'm doing that you might find interesting is interviewing experts. So um, relevant to this to addiction work, I interviewed Tom Costin, who's on the left here from Baylor, who's working on a vaccine to prevent overdose. Um, I think that's really a cutting edge work that's not well known. And Vaughn McCall on the right, looking at how sleep is disorganized by drugs and also alcohol and drug withdrawal and how that's not taken into consideration as a major cause of relapse. And last but not least, I interviewed Brian Furline, who's an MD PhD student of mine, who's now uh, running the Yale Psychiatric Emergency Room and dealing with overdoses all the time on the opioid epidemic and opioid overdoses from the point of view of a large, um, well-known teaching hospital, Yale New Haven Hospital and the Yale VA systems. I think um, all of these SDA experts provide real-time answers to some of the questions that clinicians have. Certainly, they, they, um, they're they really happy that we're sharing um, what they have learned um, it takes a year to get an article published and, and oftentimes they can tell us what to do in the meantime. When I grow up, I want to be a track star. No one ever says, I want to be a junkie when I grow up. But I want to be a ballerina. You get thousands of kids who are getting high make a mess of their lives. I want to be a nurse. Don't let drugs get in the way of your dreams. So this is um, a really interesting commercial. Um, at that time, in the early 80s, I was a psychiatric uh, advisor on a volunteer basis with a group of advertising executives that were developing drug prevention advertising. And their main expertise at the time um, was in selling things, advertising to sell. And they had the challenge of advertising to unsell. And they would, it was a, a VHS technology time. And we'd package together VHF tapes and send them to stations. And the stations could run them in PSA slots. This was a PSA that we sent at the same time as This Is Your Brain on Drugs. And you'll note that it's an opioid overdose. So this is, um, in my career, the second major opioid epidemic. The first one we um, uh, had to deal with, uh, with education, prevention, detox, methadone, at residential treatment with places like Daytop Village and so on. And uh, it was a 
very, very difficult as that ad summarizes. So um, my whole career and uh, from the early 70s in addiction boiled down to what do drugs of abuse have in common? Is it their chemical structure? No. Is it something else? No. It's really just that if you take a laboratory animal, uh, uh, rodent, non-human primate, or this has been done in human laboratories as well, you take, take them and give them access to a drug intravenously by hitting a telegraph key or a lever, they'll hit it and that hitting will cause a drug to be injected and make it more likely they hit it again and again and again. So self-administration, uh, development of acquired uh, drive state, if you will, is what these drugs of abuse have in common. There are other things that Jackie always reminds me they have in common. They all release dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. They can all be conditioned so that you could uh, shine a bright light, activate the key, enable the animal to hit the lever, get cocaine or another drug, shine a bright light, activate the key, and after a while, just shine a bright light, and that would cause the brain reaction dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens um, just on the basis of, of the pairing. So uh, it was true what people told you at Woodstock, a certain song would come on and they would feel like they were under the influence of drugs and sometimes they weren't. Drugs simulate their own taking, but in the process of doing that, what we've mostly neglected is that they change the brain. They change the brain's reward threshold, meaning that the amount of electrical stimulation necessary to produce the same well-being state is increased just by having the experience of injecting yourself with drugs. Now, does this return to normal? Um, it's not clear how long that takes. It's not clear what we can do to accelerate it, but it's part of this bad learning. The brain learns to do this, to get access to the reward system. And in doing that um, develops, uh, it changes the way the brain is organized around reinforcement. Just think about it. I've written a thousand peer reviewed scientific papers. The reinforcement is really delayed. You do all the work, you write the paper, you get the peer reviews, you edit, re edit it, you rewrite it, you send it, you get your reviews. You do it, it's published. It's, there's such a delay of gratification that it's hard to imagine that if you learned drug abuse solutions that you would be able to tolerate all that waiting. Um, it's hard enough uh, for um, people to wait in line, let alone wait a year for a paper to be uh, published. So there's bad learning, self-administration, craving, wanting, loss of control, that defines addiction. Food, while not the primary focus of this talk, um, works in the same way. Um, and as many of you know, if you work in eating disorders, I work with Bart Hubble um, closely and um, worked with his students in his lab before and after his passing. And his work clearly showed that sugar was self-administered by lab animals, met these criteria for a drug of abuse and even cause dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. And my work with Nicole Levine is my last patent um, saying that this sugar self-administration model could be used as a model for, to test new medications and new approaches to obesity. And that's not my only patent, but to start here, we'd start with clonidine um, and then the dopamine hypothesis and move on. So as I said, we've had opioid epidemic and at that time we did cannabis smoking and um, we had uh, Woodstock and the whole generation. And I learned about opioids at Yale and we had um, a large number of opioid uh, patients coming in both as overdoses and I used Narcan, Naloxone in emergency department in, uh, uh, oh, I'd say 74. Um, and um, also had the chance to uh, give naltrexone at that time and methadone in a methadone program.
Drugs, as I said, stimulate their own taking, release dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which is a, a major network responsible for saying, good boy or girl, do that. Again, that's a, a good thing to do. Um, there's a relationship between the ventral tegmental area and the prefrontal cortex that's very important in, in uh, motivated behavior and um, in all of our like higher behaviors as well. Drug use has, has not gone away. We had, uh, after the opioid epidemic, the last time a, a cocaine epidemic and then other drug epidemics followed. Um, and as we see in monitoring the futures, some drug use decreases, other drug use increases. And um, while we've done great with cigarette smoking, we've done less well with uh, cannabis smoking and cannabinoid use and less well with um, opioid um, use. Uh, the um, tobacco is a relevant model because of smoking and prevention. Um, we'll stop short. Like that in the anyway, one night I saw him at a party. When I got up the nerve to say hello. And then he took out a cigarette. <laughs> Blows my whole image of him. I mean, I know I make some people nervous, but I thought he had it together. Smoking, it's a dead giveaway. I think people who smoke are real losers. So this is a, a uh, an ad part of a series of ads that Brooke Shields did, um, which many have con considered critical in helping to re-stigmatize cigarette smoking. So that um, keep in mind that cigarette smoking was common, uh, cigarette smoking in public was common, and even in my own medical school class, cigarette smoking was common. They had ashtrays in the lecture halls in the 70s. So um, uh, to say that smoking was bad or that smokers were a loser, or that cigarette smokers clothes smell or that cigarette smokers secondhand smoke could infect you and cause sickness and illness was all very, very new. And um, many public health researchers consider that approach to be very effective, more effective than any of the medication assisted um, treatments, uh, more, more effective than um, the, uh, um, you know, the patch or the gum or any of the other things that, that we've used from time to time in um, our approach to cigarette smokers. So I think it's really critical to think about the whole work and the, the work about cigarette smoking um, and how that relates. We have not um, taken that approach for other drugs of abuse or for alcohol with the exception of stigmatizing and rightly so, of course, um, any drinking and driving. Cigarette smoking, there was always an exception to the rule and whether it be a particular celebrity or not, it's important to note that everybody knows somebody who smoked cigarettes their whole life and had no um, obvious consequences. The stigmatizing was relevant in secondhand smoke and, and think about how things have changed. We have fines for smoking when someone smokes in a hotel room. We have a hazmat, almost hazmat approach like meth uh, and cleanup fees in rooms due to uh, um, nicotine residue. Uh, and there is the same uh, effect um, causing changes in cannabis uh, use as we morph from smoking to other kinds of use because there is secondhand exposure effect. Firefighters put out the flames and discovered an elaborate pot growing operation there in the garage. Firefighters say some of those marijuana plants did burn. They also say one person was treated for smoke inhalation. I have so much smoke. <laughs> We've done similar experiments in, in animals and laboratories with secondhand smoke. So as the THC content has gone up, 
smoking, you can get secondhand effects. Um, and secondhand, like firsthand effects, interact with the brain's reinforcement system. And again, chronic use makes depression more likely and even suicidal thinking more likely. And at the same time, gives the conflicting message because of the anxiolytic and other effects reported by health providers and others. Um, but marijuana use disorder is increasing and um, people are coming into treatment, especially teenagers uh, for uh, chronic uh, use with depression and with uh, uh, primary substance use disorder. So again, drugs of abuse um, stimulate their own taking, cause craving and wanting, interact with dopamine systems, and in the uh, as a uh, almost side effect, change the brain's reward threshold, but it's not clear that it changes back. Part of the language problems, and, and one of the things I learned early on is just how do we communicate? Because a drug isn't a drug isn't a drug. We talk about cocaine. Cocaine tea drinking is not the same as coca leaf chewing, is not the same as cocaine hydrochloride powder sniffing, is not the same as cocaine free base smoking, is not the same as cocaine hydrochloride injecting or crack smoking. So the, the drug itself is one part of it. And cocaine does have a great fit within the brain, but it's still not perfect. Cocaine is not dopamine. And when we say cocaine blocks dopamine reuptake, it doesn't have a perfect dopamine fit. And hence in chronic use, you can see it causing changes in this part of the brain. Root of administration, as I said, IV use is smoking. Uh, they're considered the same. Smoking is injection without a needle, dose. Dose is important. When cannabis was 0.5% THC, the effects were quite different than when it was 12% THC. Fit in the brain, and then there's neurotoxic and residual effects. What the user brings, this is critical. So there's pre-existing vulnerabilities, sexual, physical, emotional trauma. That was a self-medication. A person who's depressed or anxious might find themselves more interested in one drug than the other. Age your first use. The earlier you use, the more likely it is that you have binge use or dependence. The later you use, the less likely. You know, the, think about just the early days of cigarette smoking. They used to give tobacco away or have candy cigarettes or freely accessible cigarette machines um, or, uh, or underage drinking, binge drinking and, and the relationship to alcohol dependence. But our work has also shown that children born of cigarette smoking mothers um, have a higher proclivity for cigarette smoking. Um, the cigarette smoke in the house of a child growing up, those children have a higher proclivity and there appears to be a similar relationship for other drugs that might be in the air or atmosphere. Clean air, clean water would be optimal age of first use, and that's related to genetic and epigenetic effects. Other things um, haven't been as well studied, but are really important. So the lowest ranking um, primate in a monkey colony has the highest addiction liability, and the highest ranking alpha um, animal has the lowest. Availability and price. We see that in the opioid epidemic, because clearly as um, we've gone from you needed a doctor's prescription, you needed a doctor's visit, you needed to buy um, and fill your prescriptions to um, widely available, cheap and potent opioids like heroin and, and fentanyl, um, the whole uh, name of the, the opioid epidemic has uh, changed and overdoses have been so widespread as a result in addition to dependence. Stigma, um, that's highly related to first use, and as I mentioned, trauma and PTSD. We do have this relationship clearly that as drugs cause dopamine release, they downregulate the D2 system, and you can see it from left to right, and the orange being the 
dopamine receptors, and then cocaine causing a, a complete down regulation, alcohol half in the middle, and food addiction in the middle of like that. You remember the frying egg. So the United States in the current opioid epidemic, we are the major consumer in North America, the major consumer of opioids. The, all the world's manufacturing, most of them go here. And um, you could say that for many of the drugs of abuse, that we're the consumer nation, and many of the producing company, com countries um, say that at national and international prevention meetings all the time, that it's our country's interest in cocaine that causes um, them to build uh, disposable submarines to go from uh, Colombia to uh, Florida filled with uh, cocaine or um, opioids to pour over the, the, the porous um, border. Um, all of this drug abuse has meant that uh, accidents, what's here categorized as unintentional injuries, this is in the last CDC statistic report. Uh, and if you add up accidents and suicide, it's well in, in um, it's a number three cause of all deaths. Many of the cancer deaths are substance related or food related, as well as the heart disease deaths are tobacco, alcohol, and drug and uh, food related. So uh, while um, unintentional injuries, overdoses, and suicides is number three, many of the first two are also related. I won't, I won't have time to go through all the celebrities who've died recently, um, but one thing to note is that each of their deaths don't seem to turn into a teachable moment. They're tragic and um, they have followings and loved ones and it's, it's always really sad. And we um, struggle with that. And the coverage then um, is short lived and um, it's not taken to heart by, by occasional users or those who are dependent. Um, and I'm not sure about that, but it's um, important for us to discuss. In this case, the rapper had been open about his struggles with depression and addiction. And I, I mentioned that by, because again, depression may be a natural consequence of use. And it may be that it's the rule rather than the exception. It's not that pre-existing depression causes drug use, even though that could be a risk factor and important to consider. But for many cases, use targets the brain's pleasure and reinforcement system, undermines that system, compromises it, and causes it to not function as well as before, taking away the experience of pleasure in ordinary life, which psychologists call anhedonia, and leaving the person with a sense of lack of pleasure and depression. Deaths involving fentanyl and opioids have increased tragically. And we said in all of the state reporting systems, unintentional drug overdoses have been reported to be increased. We challenge this sometimes because even though uh, overdoses are accidental, um, it appears the majority of the time, some overdoses are poisonings because the drug contains toxic substances and others may be suicide attempts. Some people have passive suicidal thoughts, an ideation, some uh, users wish they would die, some will tell you they were hoping that they wouldn't wake up. And many people who've administered Narcan to those who've overdosed will tell you that on occasion, the patient will be angry that they were resuscitated. And on other occasions, they may say that they wish to die or not wake up. So this has been an area that we've been investigating most recently. If uh, 
and you can see the, the reference at the bottom and you can pull up the whole article, but um, it's pretty clear that comorbidity of depression, substance use, and some of the opioid overdoses being a result of untreated uh, and progressive depression is a relevant topic for discussion. 50% of patients with opioid use disorder have histories of major depression. And most recently, the president of the American Psychiatric Association did a guest post on NIDA director Nora Volkow's blog, bringing up these data and asking the opportunity the question of whether some accidental overdoses are actually um, suicides. And part of what we see in the kind of deaths of despair and hopelessness and crisis. Uh, but regardless, these are, are tragic deaths that we need to develop intervention and treatment strategies once a person is identified uh, and they are affecting our uh, life expectancy as a nation as well. After naloxone um, overdose rescue, we need a strategy so that individuals with opioid use disorders are treated and not just given an appointment or uh, given um, someone to help them find treatment, stay in treatment, and um, re uh, prevent relapse. This is really very important. In physician addicts, we have five-year treatment horizons, not five weeks or, or, uh, or less. And um, opioid use disorders, uh, post-overdose uh, patients are highly vulnerable for repeat overdoses and um, need intensive uh, treatment, not um, anything less. Certainly we've made big advances in having naloxone available, um, not just um, for intravenous use, but intranasal as well. And um, it, naloxone is an important MAT, but you have to think of it like CPR or cardioversion as a first step but it doesn't tell you really what's the cause of the heart disease, what's the, uh, and what um, should be done about it long-term. Psychiatrists and psychologists have important uh, roles in evaluation of patients. And we, we have a, a recent study that we're doing at Washington University in St. Louis, looking at how many patients who've overdosed um, have had comprehensive suicide and mental health assessments for planning and for treatment purposes. We know um, just from NIDA work and other work um, that's reported that, that um, the likelihood of a suicide attempt is related um, not just to major depression, but to drug and alcohol use and life events. And it's very, very important to think about it. Um, but um, in addition to accident, suicide, we have adulterants being added to um, street heroin and, and fentanyl. And these are just some list of those that have been found in recent uh, sampling and surveys. Suffice it to say that many of them can make uh, toxicity more likely and problems more likely. Celebrities' deaths have been tragic as well as their life after addiction can be uh, challenging with changes from uh, elite athlete to um, uh, someone who uh, has uh, often been described as defining addiction as saying, if it's abstinence or my job, I'll, you can keep the job. All of that involves changes in the brain. So again, drugs of abuse cause euphoria. They're taken to produce euphoria. And just like um, withdrawal is the opposite of the drug effect, 
If opioids cause pinpoint pupils, opioid withdrawal causes dilated pupils. If opioids cause constipation, opioid withdrawal causes diarrhea. If opioids ca cause euphoria, withdrawal causes dysphoria and a highly negative affect and can cause um, the feel-good circuits to be compromised and not work right. And that's led a number of people to suggest that over time, we're going to have to develop brain stimulation, direct brain um, treatments to reprogram this brain reward circuitry so that people would return or could return to the uh, person that they were beforehand. Again, once we understand how this dopamine system works, food, sex, and other interact with it, and um, There's, it's funny, Jackie and I were talking about this before I got on. There's some experiments that can only be done in humans. And um, the, the human dopamine system, the feel good system is different than the non-human primate system. And this has only been discovered quite recently. We used to say that we could study 100% of drug effects because the nucleus accumbens system was phylogenetically stable, it was same from rats to non-human primates to people. And therefore animal models for addiction were equal to human experience, but that's no longer the case now that we know that human uh, pleasure system is much more highly evolved and quite um, different, surprisingly so, than other um, animals. Um, Pat covered this. So we won't have to mention this very well, but we will have to say at the end of the day, um, it, is it uh, the chicken or the egg? Can um, people, we really put the person 100% back together again or not? And that's because when we look at all of the changes that occur in addiction, they're significant and structural. So there's changes in choice in like yes or no should i do this or not there's changes in in prefrontal ability to make decisions like is this what is a risk benefit but clearly um they, this system is compromised over um, use and may be harder to repair than we think there's emotional dysregulation that occurs um, there's just total awareness of body and space and drive states, whether food or sex, hypothalamic function, like temperature or sleep, memory, and all of those um, are compromised. And it's not clear how they just come back together without intensive treatment. Um, just taking the drug away will not be enough, in my opinion. So um, uh, it's not surprising that while um, we've not been looking, the burden of severe mental illness has shifted. Uh, younger people having more problems as use and abuse has increased. Drugs produce a sense of well-being. They change the brain's reinforcement system. They change the brain's reward pleasure system and hierarchical organization. And just withdrawal alone produces depression and over the long term, the recovery of anhedonia. Um, it can be done. Um, while we talked about some celebrities on one side, Bruce Springsteen's book reminds us that it can be done and that um, uh, his life was uh, helped tremendously by uh, uh, long-term work. And I do think that's key because when you look about uh, addiction and depression, it's depression for a good reason, a depression that's related to loss of time, loss of friends, loss of function, loss of social supports, great number of losses, um, trauma that's occurred along the way, but also 
structural brain changes that are very hard to understand or remedy. Um, with that comes changes in pain threshold, happiness, dual disorders, and um, the debate that we've had in the field of psychiatry is do, does depression cause drug abuse or does drug abuse cause depression? And I'd say uh, Med Kansian's argument that uh, depression causes drug abuse um, has uh, some relevance as well as the opposite argument that we can see in impaired physicians where their own drug use causes depression and dual disorders become the rule rather than the exception because the brain's reward, mood, and circuitry related to drug effects are compromised. As we learn more about anhedonia and depression, we learn more about how drugs can compromise the system and how uh, important it is to have prevention, um, not use, no first use, or at least delay use until the brain's fully organized and functional, um, reduce teen use and so forth. And people now are studying depressed rats to get an idea of alcohol and others. Um, Kitty Dukakis's recent interviews on dual disorders are pretty important because she was treated uh, a, a number of times for alcoholism uh, alone and only until her depression was managed did she feel like she was um, fully um, treated. In uh, 2009, we set up a transcranial magnetic stimulation center at uh, UF and hoped to be able to address this. And I think today that work is ongoing in California and throughout the United States, including at NIDA's new um, center that's looking at transcranial magnetic stimulation in rehabilitating the addicted brain um, led by Antonello Bunchy and highlighted in the recent National Geographic where there was a cover story on addiction um, talking about the use of, of painless uh, magnets um, to reprogram the brain. So um, I'll uh, close this um, section of the talk by saying that neurocircuitry is important. Um, understanding the brain targets for drugs of abuse are important as to help us understand the circuitry, thinking that the circuitry will heal itself, and maybe it does in some cases, um, uh, may not prove to last scientific scrutiny. Healthy eating, clean air, diet, exercise, meditation, um, other uh, approaches may be important, new relationships, 12 steps, um, all the uh, getting into a, a daily routine is also important. CBT and other psychotherapies are important. And understanding the level of compromise in the brain reward system and reinforcement areas will be important. And remedying that um, will be a, a challenge for uh, addiction scientists going forward. So I, I thank everybody um, for uh, being here and and look forward to uh, doing this uh, again for Jackie and the group. Um, thank you very much. Dr. Gold, thank you for the excellent presentation. That was fascinating. And we do have some questions. One is about, actually, if you all will notice in your handouts, there are several um, articles by Dr. Gold. And one of the questions was, regarding one of these articles, and it was the anti-drug vaccines in your interview with Dr. Costin. And if you could just speak to that a little bit. Thank you. So um, one of the ideas that I had in doing the research you can use was showing people what the peer-reviewed literature is. So when people talk about evidence-based treatment or evidence-based science, that's what they're talking about. And I, I spend a lot of time picking out those 10 best articles each month and summarizing them. 
but the lab, the lag between doing the science, submitting it, and having it published can be two years. So I shortcutted this by speaking directly to Dr. Costin, and he's the, the national expert and resource on development of vaccines. And there would be a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in vaccines for opioids as well as for cocaine. Some ideas that he has and work that's ongoing is a vaccine to prevent overdose, a vaccine to clear, uh, to reduce drug reinforcement so the drugs are less addicting. And he's also worked on some challenges. Think about this. God forbid we have a cocaine epidemic after this opioid epidemic. And, you know, cocaine has slipped up to number two on the drug overdose list right behind opioids. Um, we have no treatment for cocaine overdose. We have no MATs for cocaine addiction or relapse prevention. So even, you know, we're having a, a challenging enough time helping folks with opioid use disorders, overdoses and dependence. Um, and we have a plethora of safe and effective FDA approved treatments. So I think Tom Carson gives you an idea of what's on the horizon but nothing is imminent. Thank you very much. And then another question was on an additional interview you did on the sleep study. Yes. And if you could um, talk about I'll substance talk. abuse and sleep issues in your uh, interview with Dr. McCall. So mo most um, uh, people um, who are in a post addiction or have been detoxified, complain of sleep, and many people in MAT programs complain of sleep disorders. And I, I've been a very big advocate in focusing on sleep in treatment because um, sleep is often a reason for slips and relapses. Sleep is often a reason for medication um, seeking, and it's a big problem that patients have. So if you think that morphine, um, morphous, is the god of sleep. And um, morphine opioid addicts often tell you about nodding on and off and sleep. So the target is the sleep center and sleep is compromised. Sleep is also compromised by alcohol. You might pass out and fall asleep, but you wake up. And so Dr. McCall has been very interested in looking at sleep studies to see um, how long after addiction does a sleep disorder persist and whether that might be a better index of withdrawal disability than nausea and vomiting, which clearly are, are transient and not related to outcome. Treating sleep is really a very specialized area and you need a sleep expert and academic medical centers often have them to do a sleep study and to decide um, between you what might be safely done. Oftentimes, some of our impaired physicians who are in treatment will exercise and even over-exercise to the point of exhaustion to help themselves um, fall asleep and to help this part of the brain reorganize. But the sleep disability is real important um, and ignored and maybe a proxy measure um, for us to know when the person is making substantial brain recovery. Um, and it may also be a marker for uh, us to treat for TMS. Dr. McCall does TMS research as well. So um, I've called him uh, and emailed him on occasion. So he's a, a good resource to know as a, a board certified expert in sleep as well as um, psychiatry. Excellent, thank you. So to our audience, um, in the chat box, there are a couple of links to sign up for the research you can use um, by Dr. Gold. I have read over this, it is excellent, um, very understandable, different than just reading it straight out of the journal. So I think you'll really appreciate that. I highly recommend that. Um, if you are planning on uh, seeking a CE from this event, please be sure to complete the survey, which is in the chat box. 
And I think we have about five more minutes for questions. If I can keep you with us for another five minutes, Dr. Gold. So if you, the, um, yes, that's not a problem. Okay, so one of the questions is about pain, long-term pain management and addiction. What your thoughts so are on that? Really, yeah, this is this is actually a topic I'm interviewing an expert on. And um, there are really very few experts. Um, and by experts, I would mean, could you find someone who's board certified in anesthesia, board certified in anesthesia, pain or pain medicine, board certified in addiction. And, um, you know, I'm thinking that there's uh, Mel Pohl in Las Vegas and Bill Jacobs in Augusta and very few and far in between. Um, when I was at the university, Bill Jacobs was doing interventional pain management. And as a triple board certified expert, he could find some patients who were being treated with pain medicines who actually might be treated with local injections. And that was a really uh, big lesson for me. Other, there were other people that he found developed opioid-induced hyperalgesia, and he could take them off of opioids and they would have less pain than they did on them. Um, physical medicine, meditation, uh, uh, massage, heat, cold, other things are important, but you know, this is a really specialized area. If somebody has fibromyalgia or has um, had an accident or a pain syndrome, uh, it's important for them to see and be evaluated by an expert who might say, gee, you know, rather than give you a, a drug, we might give you an injection or G of the drugs that are available, this might have the least um, side effects. Uh, and for someone who has already developed a substance use disorder, um, the number of options are, are limited. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm gonna interview Bill Jacobs for sure. I may even have that uh, coming up within the next um, short period of time, but um, I remember at, uh, at the university that we'd send him patients and he'd say, you know, they just need a hip injection. They don't, uh, and um, not that that's a permanent cure, but it's certainly treating locally is much, in some cases, is much more safe and effective than giving the whole body um, opioids. Thank you. And, and one other question is about cannabis, PTSD, and the legalization of that and your thoughts about that. So, you know, I mean, I, I'm a, a big fan of the use of medications to treat people. So if you look at my research you can use, I have a lot of coverage of the double-blind, placebo-controlled, scientific studies of inhaled ketamine. And I think that um, when there are studies of uh, pharmaceutical medication administration in uh, uh, published in peer-reviewed journals, that I always will cover them. And I, um, uh, I don't have any problem with any of that. Now, I do think that that's a preferable route to widespread access, the ketamine route, than the ballot route. But um, I'm not a politician. Yeah, wisely said. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Gold. This has been excellent. Again, I encourage everyone to sign up for research you can use. and. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to have Dr. Gold back for some other exciting presentations. Hope you all have a great day. Thank you for attending the conference. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Bye-bye.